Muchas gracias a todos y a todos. Gracias por asistir a hoy a este seminario de los dijous aquí a online y aquí a Lipes, porque también hay gente teta. Eh, bé, el motivo una mica de por qué quería voy a invitar a Amanda Henry una mica es para unir a estos dos mons que que tenga que tenga actualmente el pasado más relacionado con Lipes no y a mes hay a qué mon mes presente y futuro relacionado con la meva, amb els meus postdocs a, a la universidad de de Leiden vaig conèixer la Amanda al 2015 cuando vaig fer una estada al Max Plan de Leipzig una estada durante la mediata eh, etapa de, doctoral y ahora, pues bueno, después con Bach acababa, vais a contactar a Mella y perder maná diferentes, porque me apoyé en diferentes postdocs y vais a tener un mundo de sort y vais primero a conseguir a Margarita Salas, a Mella, a Amanda y la en que ve, pues comenzaré también a Mella, a la, la, la Marie Curie. Amanda es especialista en, en, en micro remains y también es una oportunidad también ver una mica cola, más que seminarios del Dijous, todo lo que sigue relacionado, todo lo que estés charradas más relacionadas a marca botánica que también a veces se troben, se troben a falta. Eh, ella es profesora asociada a, eh, a la Facultad de Arqueología de Leiden y es también directora ejecutiva de la parte de, de recerca. Hoy en una charrada sobre eh, micro remains y sobre dieta humana y creo que puede ser muy interesante eh, eh, contactar con ella. Y eh, Amanda, eh, I would like to, to, to thanks to accept to this invitation in this lecture. So thank you for your time and whenever you want, you can start with your presentation. Thank you very much. OK, hi, everybody. Um, just so you know, while I'm sharing my screen, I don't actually see you or uh, yeah, anything. Yeah. So yeah. please uh, let me know using your voice. Just unmute and say something if if you've got uh, an issue with the presentation. Uh, also, as you may hear, I'm an American and I tend to talk pretty quickly. So I'm going to try to keep things slow while still within the 20 minutes about a uh, time limit. I, as I Tor said, I, I have focused a lot on using plant microremains to reconstruct human diet in my research. I'm broadly interested in diet in the past, and that's because like uh, a lot of archaeologists, I'm interested in diet because it gives us a broad variety of information about people in the past, everything from um, understanding things like social stratification in recent societies, uh, looking at migration across a variety of time scales because of course people bring their food with them, looking at trade networks as well, how the connections between civilizations um, has largely been based on, on the trading of food items as, um, as well as other prestige goods. But also, uh, and I referred to this earlier when I was uh, talking with Aitor, that the uh, food items can signify individual and group identity. This is a a traditional Dutch uh, dish, in fact, quite local to Leiden itself, called a hutspot that is eaten every year on our city festival on the 3rd of October. And so food becomes very much a marker of, of identity, um, as well as uh, of individual identity, as well as group identity. Um, I'm broadly interested in diet, as I said, but more particularly diet in the ancient past, largely pre-agriculture. Um, unfortunately, many of the narratives that we use about the evolution of human diet in the ancient past revolves around stories about hunting and meat eating and how these uh, cooperative tasks and activities, but also the increase in calories and fat, um, would have both facilitated and required reorganization of our biology, including things like brain size, but also our social structure and how we interact with people. And so people have created these, these big narratives about how hunting and meat eating have led to the evolution of our biology and behavior today. Um, but what has always struck me in these narratives is that the potential role for plant foods has often been overlooked or underemphasized that in fact most of our ancestors lived in uh, very plant rich environments and would have had uh, probably the majority of their calories from plant foods yet we have fewer ways of um, investigating what plants may have been consumed. Um, there is as well a variety of factors that have led to something of a bias against uh, studying plant foods. Um, some of these come from the fact that many of our ethnographic studies of recent historical hunter-gatherers have focused largely on men's tasks, that the ethnography was done by men and that the men 
for various reasons, tended to focus on what the men in their community were doing. And that, of course, tended to be more related to hunting. Um, there's also an expressed uh, preference on the part of a lot of hunting and gathering groups for animal foods, for meat. Um, yet we know that the majority of the calories, despite the preference for meat, comes from, or the, the majority of daily calories comes from plant foods. Um, another bias working against our understanding of plant foods in the past is that they're not as visible in the archaeological record. Unlike bones, they don't tend to fossilize. So we don't have uh, as much easy access to seeing them in the past. Yet for from a variety of studies, from sort of human physiology um, all the way up to studies of sort of social organization, we know that plant foods are important. Like I said, they provide not only calories, but vital nutrients. Um, they, the, the extraction of nutrients from the plant foods often requires the development of a pretty complex toolkit um, because plants are available only seasonally and in very patchy locations. Uh, their efficient use um, requires quite advanced social organizations, sometimes sexual division of labor, but also forward planning and um, sometimes a seasonal round. So using the landscape in the most effective way possible to make use of the available plant resources. Um, so for all of these reasons, uh, I've been very interesting, very interested in trying to sort of unpack uh, what we can find out about the use of plant foods in the past. Um, there are a couple of sort of established methods for looking at plants in the past, and I know some of you were aware of, of these, including looking at charcoal, at charred macrobotanical remains, and at plant processing tools. And while these give some degree of information about plant foods, uh, they are somewhat limited. Charcoal, of course, is, is in fact usually not diet related, maybe related to cooking, but not to what was actually consumed. Macrobotanical remains, unfortunately, are not often preserved, especially looking in pre-agricultural groups. And plant processing tools like this Mano and Matate are relatively new invention that the, if you're really interested in diet in the deep past, we don't have this uh, artifactual record. So instead, um, starting with my PhD and continuing on then through my, my career, I've been focusing on these two plant micro remain types. Um, these are microscopic residues of plants that have unique morphologies that allow us to identify the plant that produced them. The two main types I'm going to talk about today are starch grains or starch granules and phytoliths. Um, and I'm actually not going to talk too much about phytoliths because uh, I, I do spend more time studying starch grains and for various reasons I'll get into, they are a better record of the kinds of foods I'm interested in. So starch grains, what is a starch grain? A starch grain is um, a sort of uh, a, a, a system by which the plant stores energy. So during the daytime when light is hitting the plant, it is producing sugars. Um, these sugars are uh, then linked together into long chains called amylose and amylopectin. These two long branching carbohydrates are then assembled in a um, in a, in a very particular structure in uh, a particular organelle in the plant called an ameloplast that uh, then functions as long-term energy storage of these sugars for the plants. Starches, as I said, they have, uh, or they can have unique morphologies, which allow us to identify the the plant taxa that produced them or and sometimes the the part of the plant that they were grown in. Now, because they, they are meant as a sort of long term energy storage unit, we usually find them in the parts of plants where uh, like the seeds or the tubers, places where the plant will need to store energy for the long term. And these happily are the parts of plants that we like to eat. So uh, starch grains then become a very good marker for uh, for the consumptions of these kinds of plants and plant parts. I'm showing in these pictures how the starches look under the microscope, and I have highlighted some of the unique features that we use to identify them. Um, interestingly, when you look at a starch under cross polarized light, they have this very, very distinctive extinction cross, and that's one of the ways we identify them. Um, 
not only are they from the parts of plants that we we like to eat, but they are very abundant in food related contexts. So starches can be found in crust on pottery, um, preserved in grindstones, but especially in dental calculus, which is the mineralized plaque that forms on your teeth. Furthermore, another interesting um, attribute of starch grains is that they uh, undergo sort of predictable morphological changes based on how they are cooked or processed. So finding these altered starches in the archaeological record gives us a clue to understand the cooking or processing techniques that may have taken place. Um, a little bit on the analyses here, just to give you a taste of what it's like to use with starch grains, it's quite simple. You do need to find reference materials, so using modern plants uh, as a source of starches to, to build up a reference uh, collection. Um, and this is quite simple. You simply scrape the interior material onto a slide and look at it under the microscope. Archaeological material is also quite simple to sample. Um, if you're looking with, if you're working with stone tools, uh, you can use sort of a, a a water wash to to collect the sample material that you want to look at. If you're dealing with pottery crusts or even calculus, um, you need to sort of break up the mineral matrix, uh, usually with a chemical process, and then again look at it under the microscope. Soils are also possible to examine, but this is somewhat problematic because there's lots of different soil bacteria that really like to eat starch, so there may be um, quite a bit of removal of starches from the archaeological record. Very briefly, what are phytoliths? Phytoliths are another type of plant microdomain. Perhaps Itor has told you a little bit about his work with it. I don't want to go into detail given the expertise you have in-house. Um, but silica is absorbed by the plants and deposited within and between the cells of plants and therefore takes on unique morphologies as well. Um, and it's pretty resistant to um, dissolution, so it lasts a long time in the archaeological record. It's found in all types of plants, from grasses to trees. Um, but phytoliths tend to form in the parts of plants that we like to remove from our food. So things like husks and shells or bark. So generally they're found in external tissues. So while they're very good as a marker of environment and can be used as well for dietary reconstruction, um, it's best to have sort of a combination with starches and phytoliths together. Um, and again, phytoliths can have unique morphologies. Here you see the variation among uh, different phytolith types, and you can see that the, the range of variation of phytoliths is actually can be a little bit more than what you see in starch grains. Um, and they're often, like I said, found in parts that are not directly eaten, so they, the phytolith record tends to be removed from the food context. So you find them in threshing or harvesting areas, you find them in storage pits, you find them in plant processing areas, um, you find them in fireplaces, for example not so much in dental calculus. The processing is a little bit more, I would say, involved than starches. Here you have to remove all the organic material in order to isolate the phytoliths, either by, by burning it or by using chemicals to remove the organic material. But again, it's looked at under a microscope. With, uh, with archaeological samples, though, the processing does require multiple steps uh, to remove things like soil carbonates, organic material, sometimes humic acid, and then you have to use a heavy liquid flotation to separate the phytoliths from the other material. Um, but you can sample grindstone tools, flakestone tools, um, and calculus as well for phytoliths. Um, I did want to offer some uh, critique, let's say, of my own method with the idea that you know, if you're interested in these as ways of studying diets in the past, you should be aware of some of the limitations um, of applying plant micro-remains analysis. Um, there are, of course, many stages where the record that you recover can become biased and that it's important to understand these before making interpretations of behavior. And the first is um, that I'm going to talk about is that plant the production of starch grains, phytoliths as well, I'm going to focus broadly on starch grains, it varies both among and within plants. So some plants are always invisible. Um, things like soybeans do not produce phytoliths at all. Um, some plants that don't that, that aren't eaten all that often, but that perhaps produce a lot of starches, though, may be overrepresented in your sample. Um, another potential problem is that starch 
and phytolith morphology can considerably overlap um, both among closely related, but sometimes among distantly related taxa as well. So here I'm showing starch grains from barley, which is a grass, and from chili pepper, which is quite distantly related. And just on this view, they look quite similar. You actually have to rotate them to get them on their short edge to see that the barley has a particular fissure that the chili pepper does not. But on first glance, they look remarkably similar. So it can be hard to differentiate uh, among taxa if you don't have a sufficient reference collection. So some of the solutions to these problems, of course, is to build and to share big reference collections. And that's something that we in the field haven't been very good about recently, is, is building and sharing these reference collections. But there is a, a goal to try to put this information out there so people can see uh, pictures that they can compare their archaeological archeolog specimens to. Um, I also think it's personally really important to acknowledge this as a potential program, a uh, potential problem, and to use terminology that reflects the degree of confidence that you have in your identification. So uh, I personally prefer to use terms like um, this archaeological starch is consistent with those found in barley, rather than saying this archaeological starch is barley, right? So there's a subtle different there, difference there, but it's acknowledging uh, the fact that no reference collection is or can ever be complete. The second area where biases can occur um, is in how the plant was used in the past. Um, that even if a plant was eaten, not all of the micro remains are going to get preserved in the sample. Uh, for example, if you cook a, a plant to complete mush, all of the starches are going to be completely gelatinized and not visible anymore. Um, Pre-processing, uh, removing of husks and things can mean that the phytolith rich parts of a plant are removed off site and you're just never going to find them. Um, so there's there's lots of stages in that first interaction between the human and the plant. That means that the record that we want to find is, is not visible anymore. Um, we also know that there is a, a mismatch between the diet and the microfossil record. This is work from one of my former PhD students and he matched uh, what was, he found in the dental calculus and the teeth of chimpanzee individuals to the feeding records, both from those individuals, but also from um, the group as a whole. And so the innermost ring in this figure represents um, the percentage of diet that was represented by the micro remains, both phytoliths and starches from these various plants. And the outer two rings are two different ways of calculating that percentage of diet from the individual and the group uh, averages. And what you can see is, for example, the purple plant on the Sacaglottis in the dental calculus, it was not very um, highly represented, but in the actual feeding records, it represents quite a large, more than 30% of the diet. So there is definitely a mismatch here between what is consumed and what um, proportion are indicated in the diet. So there are some ways to address the problems of initial preservation. Um, the first is to, to know how the microfossil vari production varies among the target species. So looking carefully at multiple seeds for multiple individual plants of the same species to try to understand how that varies. Um, to do a whole bunch of experiments, um, and these are actually quite fun. You spend a lot of time cooking and processing uh, starchy rich plants to see how it looks um, after different processing regimes. Um, and uh, just to overall understand how these processing steps that you need in order to make the plant edible might remove the, the, the visible micro remains and where they might be distributed in the site. Um, the third period of potential biases comes after the discard and burial of the micro remain containing item or object. Um, we know that there are enzymes produced by bacteria in sediments that can damage and destroy starches. Um, but we also know that they don't affect all starches equally. So some plants might dis preferentially be preserved and others might disappear. Uh, we also know that phytoliths can dissolve in high pH settings. So limestone caves, while they're great for preservation of bones, are terrible for phytoliths. Um, and especially sandy soils uh, do not promote preservation of starch grains and phytoliths. They tend, they can move throughout these sediments. They can be washed out very easily. 
Um, so to better understand the microfossil survival in sediments, um, it can be very helpful if you measure the site sedimentary properties, things like the pH of the site, the moisture of the site, the bacterial content. Hang on a sec. I'm in a meeting. I'm sorry. Um, it's important to do burial tests of your target species. So if you're very interested in certain plants and how they were used, um, you it's very helpful to um, to to see what happens when these end up exposed to sedimentary bacteria. The last one I'm going to talk about, uh, the potential biasing agent, and this can be a really problematic one, um, is biases and contamination after the artifact then uh, enters the archaeological uh, assemblages. So after you've excavated, during and after the excavation. So unfortunately, many laboratory supplies are produced with starches. So they have um, already starches in them. Powdered gloves are obvious uh, as a problem, but even powder free gloves, um, they're made with starch and then the starch is washed off. But of course, they don't always get rid of it completely. So um, gloves can be a big source of contamination. Um, starches and phytoliths can be airborne, and so they can be just around in the in the air and in the environment. Um, and then, of course, certain of the methods that we use to isolate these remains can also create biases. So you can get size sorting of phytoliths types. Um, using heavy liquid flotation for starch samples can um, preferentially uh, remove the gelatinized or damaged starches from the record. So uh, it's really important for these reasons to take ample control samples um, to test for uh, contamination in the burial context, the museum context, even in the laboratory. Some examples of control samples you can take are things like bones, sediments, making water traps to test for air, definitely doing blank sides, cleaning the lab, testing how clean the lab is. Um, so these are these are ways to to overcome these biases. But even once you've done that, there are still some limitations about plant micro remains. And the first is that um, because plant micro remains tell us only about the plants, we can't ever uh, actually get at the overall meat plant to meat ratio. We see only one half of this. We, we don't see how much meat was conserved, consumed, nor how frequently um, plant foods were consumed. We also can't make statements about the total number of taxa in the diet because there are always invisible taxa and underrepresented taxa, right? So we can't say that group A, um, you know, necessarily had a much broader diet than group B. Um, we also have trouble talking about the relative proportion of taxa. Um, so if you remember the chart I showed you with the donut rings, that um, sometimes the amount of starch grains that we recover is uh, a function of how many that plant produces, not necessarily how much that plant was consumed. Um, and also, of course, as with many other archaeological records, the um, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, so that if we don't find starches from a particular plant, we can't say for sure that that plant was not consumed. Um, however, if you have good controls that are, and the overall archaeological context is well understood, then finding the micro remain in that sample um, is indicate is like 100% evidence that this was the result of human action. In other words, that a human was using that plant in the past. Um, so, so this is the main way that plant microremains can be used. Um, and just to give a quick example of the kind of work that I have been doing with plants, uh, very, very briefly. Um, Oops, I forgot this. Provided we understand and acknowledge biases, starch grains and phytolith analyses are powerful tools for understanding human use of plants. And as a brief example, we have been using them quite a lot to try to understand the diets of Neanderthals. Now, Neanderthals are often reconstructed as living in very cold environments. There have been many occasions where they have been um, compared directly to Inuit peoples uh, living in, in sort of subarctic and arctic environments um, and so there there is this long-standing debate and and uh, actually a paper came out just recently arguing from a new type of isotope analysis that uh, even in spain meat was the main component of neanderthal diets um, 
but so over the past several years, starting um, more than 10 years ago now, I've been interested in what we can say about the plant use and Neanderthal diets. And from a variety of sites um, around Europe, we have been able to recover starch grains and phytoliths from the dental calculus and Neanderthal samples. And what we found is that the um, these dental calculus samples indicate that a variety of plants were consumed, um, including things that we would recognize as foods today, things like grass seeds from re wild relatives of wheat and barley, tubers from water lilies or, or under other underground and underwater storage organs, but a variety of leafy greens as well. And when we tried to look at the variation in um, the pattern of plant microbiome use across all of these samples, um, trying to see if there were any ecological parameters that might control the numbers or the types of starches that were represented, we, we couldn't find any pattern um, so that neither the, the, the average winter temperatures nor the degree of tree cover seemed to predict the number or the types of plants that were represented um, in Neanderthal diets. Um, so that Neanderthals across all of the samples that we have examined for and, and throughout their, their um, temporal span had, from what we can tell, more or less equal use of plants. And this holds true even in the far eastern um, range, uh, far eastern margins of the Neanderthal range at Chagorskaya, where we recently had a paper that came out on this, that they, um, even there, there weren't many micro remains, but there were some that represented a couple of different plant species that were consumed, um, even in the sort of cold, very open stomach environments that they inhabited. So overall, plant micro remains have uh, provided us a window into the use of plants in the past, um, but it's important to remember that there are, of course, as with any uh, method, limitations in the kinds of questions that they can be used to answer. So. I think I'm just out of time and I wanted to thank my group members and you all for your very kind attention.